Hey guys, Zargon Templar here with another brief, brief political history. Today we're going to be talking about Colombia. Uh, we'll see if this will be one or two videos. Um, it really depends on how long this will take. Uh, Colombia is a fairly large topic. And, um, well, we'll see how it goes. So, um, the last Colombian election saw a number of different parties. Um, the vote split over a number of different parties. Um, Colombia has traditionally been a two-party system, but it's proliferated uh, over the last couple of elections. Now, it's important to keep in mind that Colombia is one of the most right-wing countries on Earth. Uh, if you add up all the right-wing parties, they get about 75 to 80 percent of the vote, depending on the election. Um, Colombia is extremely right-wing. And most of these parties aren't just like lame center-right ones. Uh, most of these parties are actually pretty hardcore. So we'll get to some of these, um, the more modern parties like Party of the U or um, Democratic Center in a bit. Uh, we're going to start off with the two main uh, participants in our little drama. That is the Colombian Liberal Party and the Colombian Conservative Party. Uh, these are two of the oldest political parties in Latin America. Uh, they were founded not too long after Colombia became an independent country, about 20 to 30 years, in the 1840s. Uh, the Colombian Liberal Party, keep in mind, uh, liberal can mean any number of things. Um, the Colombian Liberal, liberal Party is quite radically left-wing. It's substantially more left-wing than other liberal parties. Uh, liberal in America means left wing, and liberal in uh, means center left, and liberal in Europe means uh, center right. In Europe, it kind of means um, socially liberal but economically free market, whereas in America, liberal means um, socially liberal and uh, economically. Um, statist, I guess you could say. So the Colombian Liberal Party is much closer to the American idea and has flirted with open socialism at points. So it's kind of like American liberalism, but more left-wing. Um, I guess progressivism, uh, bordering on socialism, is a good way of thinking of it. And the Colombian Conservative Party is uh, quite right-wing, um, very, uh, very Christian, very socially conservative. Um, well, well, let's see here. Current program. Let's look at this program. This program looks LARPy. Is looks awesome. Uh, so, belief of God being the center of the universe. Belief in private systems. Belief in fighting communism and all its ideals. Belief in tradition, belief in free ta trade, belief in an ordered society, belief in defending family and life before anything, belief that, that these are the ideas that will provide a better future for Colombian society. Um, so I think that describes it pretty well. It's very kind of a right-wing Christian traditionalist party that is fairly economically liberal. So those are the two main... Uh, participants in our little drama, so let's get into it, shall we? So we have the, the Colombian election of 1864. I'm just choosing to start here because that's one of the earliest years we have data, uh, and this is kind of really where things begin. Um, so the Liberal Party won a huge majority. Um, the mid-19th century was dominated by the Liberal Party. Uh, the Conservatives had uh, trouble. Now, Colombia is interesting because in contrast to a lot of countries in Latin America, uh, military governments have not been that prominent. I believe there was one military government, but by and large, there's been very few um, outright dictatorships in Colombia's history. Uh, generally speaking, the elections from what I remember studying back in university uh, have generally speaking been fairly free and fair. Um, there, there's a lot of political violence, but elections continue to happen at regular intervals, and people largely can vote for whoever they want, which makes it a very strange case um, by Latin American standards. Uh, so it's rather democratic, but it's also one of the more violent countries in Latin America. Um, 
So we had the uh, Colombian election of 1864, then we head into the election of 1866. Once again, Liberal Party, as you can see, I'm, these aren't very important elections, I'm just saying that uh, to show how dominant the Liberal Party is. Now, from my understanding, um, around this time period, let's see here, Conservatives are slowly catching up, uh, but Liberals are very much in the lead. Sorry, just going through this. Uh, yeah, so the Liberals had a massive uh, spree of victories. Now, I think, uh, let's see here. Um, this is when they switched over to a six-year term. Uh, so we had the... Okay, that's not that important. Um, let's see here. So... This is when we have the beginning of the violence. Or La, La Violencia. Oh, no, sorry, not the violence, the Thousand Day War. Okay, so around this time period, um, the Conservatives changed um, a lot of the trade laws and a lot of uh, the, eco the, the economics of the country, which uh, deeply disadvantaged the Liberal Party. Um, There's an economic crisis uh, caused by a falling coffee prices in the international market, and this largely decim financially decimated the supporters of the Labour Party, Liberal Party. Uh, the Conservatives also made good on their first couple election victories uh, by um, changing electoral laws around and doing a number of things to ensure that mainly their supporters got to vote. Um, besides that, there was just a swing rightward. Now, from what I was able to look up, the National Party was just um, a faction of the Conservative Party that broke away and pursued a more openly nationalist versus, I guess, a more traditionalist policy. But they're basically just a wing of the Nash of the Conservative Party, and it's not really that important. Um, politicians sometimes choose to form their own parties when they're running for president. So probably what I would bet, what I would imagine happened was a, a member of the Conservative Party formed his own party when he was running for government, uh, running for president just so he wouldn't be um, beholden to his party. So because of the overwhelming dominance of the Conservative Party and um, a decimation of the Liberals' popular support, uh, there was also a increasing radicalization of the Liberal Party during this time period. So we entered into the Thousand Day War, in which the Liberal Party took to the jungles and um, began a uh, war to... Um, uh, attempt to wrestle power away from the conservative government. So, as the name suggests, the war went on for three years, and it was fought with the uh, Liberal Party uh, attempting to unseat the Conservative Party, and ultimately it was very bloody and uh, over 100,000 people died, but the uh, Conservatives managed to win. Um, on the one hand, the, the Liberals lost, but on the other hand, uh, there was, to some extent, an amnesty, and there was an agreement that power would be shared. Um, so it wasn't a, a complete defeat. Uh, the Conservatives won a, a victory, but not a decisive victory. So while they got to maintain all of their um, gains, they couldn't force the Liberals out of existence. Uh, so we head into just elections keep going, nothing that interesting is happening. Uh, we're about to head into... Yeah, so conservatives just continue to win elections during this time period uh, without much opposition from the Liberal Party. However, we see the Liberal Party start to um, bounce back. Uh, we also see the introduction of a Socialist Party, uh, indicating the Liberals are getting increasingly radical during this time period. Uh, the Liberals uh, continue to more or less be irrelevant um, during this era. Unfortunately, there is not election legislative election data, which tends to be a better indicator of relative party strength, because presidential elections are often very about personalities, etc. Um, so theoretically, someone could win with 90% of the vote in the presidential election, but his party could lose overwhelmingly in the legislative election. 
So they don't have data for this period, unfortunately. It's 1930. So the liberals um, succeeded in regaining power after the decades of conservative dominance following the War of a Thousand Days. Now, I, I forgot to mention, but um, during um, this time period in the aftermath of the War of a Thousand Days, um, Columbia, uh, Panama declared its independence largely supported by America, who more or less made movements indicating that it would support um, Panamanian independence from Colombia. Uh, so Colombia gradually lost a variety of territory, largely just due to the um, geography of the country. Uh, the problem with the country, uh, like parts of it broke off. Um, originally, Gran Colombia included Venezuela and Ecuador, but it was broken off. It's just very difficult terrain to manage because you have half the country on one side of the Andes and the other half of the country in the other half of the Andes. And this was back really before the country was developed to any meaningful extent. And I think Chile and a couple others also um, uh, intervened on the side of Panama. So Panama left and I think Panama was very liberal. Uh, yes, I think it was one of the most liberal parts of uh, Colombia, and that's part of the reason for conservative dominance in the following decades. So now we actually have some legislative election data. So we have the liberals uh, winning the first formal um, election. So it seems that they finally recovered, to, at least to some extent, from their defeats in the Thousand Day War. So then we continue uh, with the Liberal Party ascendant and rather dominant during this time period. Uh, the Liberal Party seems to have won a massive uh, landslide. Let me just see. Uh, I just want to check something. Um, no, that's not actually during the Civil War. I'm not really sure what happened during this time period. Um, I'm guessing this is a period of Liberal dictatorship. I had looked this up. It's not like I'm just doing this entirely off the top of my head. I just hadn't really seen anything about this time period. Then again, I'm not sure how accurate any of this is. Um, yeah, so we, we eventually see a Communist Party emerging, which will eventually become FARC, and the Social Democratic Party, which will also become FARC, uh, just various early incarnations of it. Uh, so then what happens is, after the Liberal Party's period of dominance, um, we, we head into the the violence, which is where basically the Conservative Party did what the Liberal Party had done uh, a generation earlier. Because the War of a Thousand Days was caused by uh, the Conservative Party monopolizing power and the Liberal Party taking to the jungles in an attempt to unseat them. Uh, in this case, um, the Liberal candidate for president was, ex was um, assassinated by a Conservative Party member, and the Conservative Party uh, basically began to um, stir up its supporters in getting them to uh, kill liberal supporters and liberal partisans. So let's see here. So the conservative um, party and the liberal party had their own militias, their own self-defense groups. At the meantime, the communist party, which would eventually become FARC. Uh, I don't believe they're called FARC yet. No. Not for a while. Uh, let's see here. Which would eventually become FARC. Uh, the Catholic Church supported the Conservative Party, and it, there are charges that some priests were calling for the open uh, murder of various liberal, um, liberal groups. Um, so yeah, so the Catholic Church got involved. Uh, the Communists, Conservatives, and Liberals were involved. The Communist Party at this point in time was rather small, but it was still just a massive period of instability, violence, and uh, widespread destruction. Kind of like the anarchy in uh, medieval Britain, it was largely a time to settle scores and to steal anything not bolted down uh, due to a general breakdown of law and order. Some people guess that between 200 and 300,000 people uh, were killed during this time period. Eventually what happened when it was clear no one could win the election, uh, the Liberal and Conservative Party encouraged uh, a general in the army to perform a military coup. 
Uh, so we have, let's see here, what's his name again? Um, yes, Gustavo Rojas Penilla um, launched a military coup which made himself military dictator of Colombia. It should be noted, though, within months of him declaring himself dictator, um, actually, when he when he performed the coup, no one objected, and there was no one killed during the coup. Um, Parliament legally appointed him president uh, without needing an election. Uh, that was not under the threat of force. It's important to keep in mind that what, what ultimately happened was more or less the political leadership of the country realized that things wouldn't end without a strong man who could just put down all the various violence and stuff. So... It's important to keep in mind, Colombia only had basically like one year of military dictatorship before they formalized the rule. And I don't think there's really anyone who argues that it wasn't representative of what the, the people generally wanted and what um, the government um, was interested in. Uh, let's see here, Chamber of Representatives. Okay, yeah, we see during the violence, um, the Liberal Party... Uh, boycotted the uh, parliament largely because the conservative party managed to retake control of the country during the violence. And this is just kind of how things work. Um, we head now into the National Front where the military dictator basically came up with a compromise that the conservative and liberal parties would share power and that there would be a conservative president every four years, and then there would be a liberal president every four years. And they would share power. I think they would share state governments. Um, they would kind of have moderate policies, etc. Um, so when this happened, um, the political parties became more modern, uh, more moderate, and that combined with a general agreement among all the political elites to stop the violence um, eventually led to a crackdown which brought some peace to Colombia at long last. So now what I is we see a fairly um, normal, more a more normalized election thing. We see the votes being uh, split between parties in a more kind of normal way. What do I mean by normal? Uh, before this period with the National Front we were seeing uh, the two parties, like one party getting 100% of the vote. Uh, that does not happen after the National Front. Uh, okay, so then we, we go through. Uh, then we have the 70s and 80s, which are marked by the, the, the Colombian drug cartels, and we have the rise of FARC. Let me just look up FARC. Which is, of course, a communist... Um, movement. Let's see here. So almost as soon as the violence ended, FARC showed up. Uh, FARC is a communist uh, guerrilla uh, movement which controls much of the Colombian countryside. It's recently been put down uh, to some extent, but it was um, quite large at its peak. I believe, uh, let's see here, it is notable for using child soldiers, for using selling drugs to fund the majority of its uh, fund the majority of its activities. Uh, a lot of the Colombian drug trade basically came from FARC taking to the jungles in the aftermath of the violence and the formation of the National Front. Uh, they seized a lot of the countryside. Uh, the Cubans, Venezuelans, and Soviet Union provided them with manpower and supplies, and they basically. With the the uh, money they, the supplies they received combined with the money they made from selling drugs, uh, they went to war with the federal government, and we had a conflict that what has is still going on to this day. Um, the conflict's been going over for about forty to fifty years, uh, with varying degrees of power, uh, varying degrees of violence. Uh, so yeah, we had FARC and the various drug cartels backing it. Uh, then we have the Colombian government, and the Liberal and Conservative parties are both against FARC, although there are some sympathizers in the Liberal Party, largely because FARC wants to uh, completely redo society. Okay, so according to this, um, 
the National Front and the, the agreement of both parties to repress communism resulted in the creation of FARC by the more left-wing liberals and the communists. So the, the, um, the difficulties with waging a war in Colombia, which is largely rural, has huge jungles and um, mountains combined with uh, the immense wealth of FARC, who I believe is still the the richest terrorist organization on Earth, um, meant that they were able to hold out for a very long time. As a result, in about 200,000 people killed. A lot of them, though, were just disappeared. Um, FARC extensively uses kidnapping to fund its operations, and the government often relies on paramilitaries. Uh, we have an extremely violent a uh, couple of decades in Colombia, where Colombia had one of the highest murder rates on Earth, largely due to paramilitary violence. But just Colombia, largely due to the breakdown of law and order there, and trends in the rest of Latin America, became the world hub for drugs, uh, which FARC largely used to fund themselves. Uh, this would continue more or less until we have the election of Urbe. Let me see, where's Urbe? Is he 1990? Uh, 1994. Uh, 1998. Where's Urbe? There we go, Urbe. So, uh, what basically happened was, uh, we had Urbe, who was a former member of the Conservative Party, who came to power on the platform of ending the... Oh, he was a liberal, actually. That's really strange. I thought he was a, a conservative. Um, okay, well, he's he's ultra-right-winged anyways. He's he's kind of a real edgelord. Uh, but anyways, he basically came to power of on the platform of, abs of just annihilating FARC and ending the whole war forever. So the conservatives and the other kind of moderate and center-right factions form, form together around Urbe, Uribe, and said, okay, Uribe, the Liberals had previously tried throughout the 90s to negotiate with FARC, and it wasn't getting anywhere. So they said, Irby, just go nuts and take these guys down. So the, the United States provided massive military aid to Colombia. Keep in mind, the Colombian government was always fighting against FARC, but they just stepped it up, turned it up to 11, and just went to town on them with a lead pipe and a blowtorch. Eventually, what happened with a combination of strong U.S. aid and the Colombian government actually trying to do something about it, unlike Mexico, where the government and the cartels are uh, very close together. Part of the reason there's so much violence in Colombia was because the government was always trying to control the cartels. Uh, the government was not corrupt in the way Mexico or like Bolivia's government is. I mean, there's, it's corrupt, but it's not run by the cartels. Colombia is not a openly narco state in the way Mexico is. So... Because of Urbe, they were able to completely break the power of the cartels uh, and more or less dismantle them. Uh, it dramatically shifted Colombian politics rightward. And uh, let's see here. And now the right holds uh, massive majorities at all levels of uh, government. Okay, that was the last election the liberals would win. Uh, oh, wait, oh, sorry, the liberals won another election, my bad. Um, I think 2006. Uh, it's very confusing. Um, just because of the way this thing is. Uh, but in general, the right has started to win since Irby came to power in the early 2000s. And he's formed a, his own movement around him, which is kind of a nationalist, uh, third way party that is extremely... Um, it's very right-wing, very nationalist, very pro-law um, and order, um, and, and various uh, forms of socialism. So largely, the, the various uh, right-wing parties compose the vast majority of the seats in Colombia today. Uh, Colombia is a very right-wing country, and Urbe's efforts have seen the murder rate dramatically drop, the economy grow, since there aren't people shooting each other on the streets anymore. And the gradual uh, narrowing in on FARC, uh, destroying a lot of the areas that they've been occupying, and largely wiping them out. Uh, so FARC still exists to this day, but they're nowhere near the power that they possessed at their high watermark. 
Um, they are no longer actively fighting the army and basically just snipe at the police now. Uh, there's a very good possibility at some point in the future FARC will, vet, will disappear or will cease pretending to even be a oppositional government and will just become a cartel. Because that's basically what they are at the moment. They are not a real uh, rival to the Colombian government as they had hoped to be during the previous civil war. So hopefully that wasn't too confusing or too strange. Um, I know I kind of babbled on a bit, but it's a very complicated topic. And a lot of these countries, it's, it's very unclear um, because we don't always have all the background information of what what happened internally it could be hard to tell when things are democratic when things are not democratic and when different stuff happens so i hope you enjoy it this is argent templar signing out